basic elements of talent that affect every employee in every company. Is there a simplistic formula that would help me understand and define what talent is? And we came up with a formula of three things. Talent is competence. This is supposed to be a picture of a brain. It's not a very good picture. <laughs> competence. Do my employees have the competence to do the work expected of them? Both the competence today and the competence tomorrow. As the business conditions in Vietnam change and we try to do new things, do our employees have the skills to do that work? The second piece of the formula is commitment. In about 1995 or 90, somewhere in the 90s, I wrote an article, Talent is Competence Times Commitment. Competence means our people are smart and bright. Commitment means their hands and their feet are engaged. And they're participating in the company. Sometimes you can have high competence. Somebody is very smart, very talented, very bright, but they're not very committed. They don't work very hard. The multiplier means that you have to have both. On the other hand, you could have somebody who's not very competent and they, they are very committed. They work very hard. That's a problem because they're working hard, probably not making good decisions. We need both competence and we need commitment. Then starting about three years ago, we began to discover that there's a third piece to the formula. My employee in talent may be competent. He or she may have the skills both today and tomorrow. They may also be committed. They're willing to work hard. They're dedicated. They're hardworking. They show up. But what they now need is to find meaning and purpose in the work they do. Because sometimes people may show up, but not give their best effort. In fact, in the recent recession, in the West especially, as the recession hit, ironically, the commitment scores went higher. Because the employees who worked in the companies had an attitude of gratitude. I'm grateful to have a job when many of my friends don't. And so their engagement or satisfaction scores seem to go up. Now what's happened in the last nine months is that about 50% of the most talented employees in companies are ready to leave because they didn't find meaning in the work they did. They were committed, they showed up. But if they weren't finding a sense of real purpose and meaning, their commitment was not long-term. So that formula for us tells us what talent needs to look at. If I want to be a manager of talent, and in fact the formula probably says talent is productivity. If I manage those three things, I can begin to build productivity out of my employees. And if I want to be a manager of talent, I need to be able to manage those three dimensions. On the one hand, I manage confidence. Do I have the right people in the right place at the right time with the right skills? On the other hand, I manage commitment. Are my people working hard? Are they doing their best? Are they engaged? And finally, I manage contribution. Are my people finding meaning? I saw somebody had a book called The Why of Work. Uh, and I appreciate your having the book. Thank you very much. Uh, we wrote that book last year to say people need a why of how they work. What I'm now going to go through is walk through some of the tools for talent in each of those three areas so that you have specific things that you might be able to do to manage competence, commitment, and contribution. The first one is competence. Competence begins with a statement of what makes a good employee around here. What makes a good employee? We do a study called Top Companies for Leadership. The best companies in the world for leadership. Of the 500, 450 companies we surveyed this year, almost 99% of the companies have a competency model. They have a model of what set of skills do we need for the future. 
But most companies have a model focused on the left. The top companies have a confidence model focused on the right. Their competencies are focused not generically, but strategically. What's next? What skills do my employees need in the future? In fact, we did an exercise at the university where I teach. We had companies send in, a couple of years ago, their competency models. So the company would send in the competencies they thought their leader should have. We posted them on the wall. And we played a game. Name that company. What we discovered is it was easier to name the consulting firm who created the model than the company for whom they created the model. Because they were generic. The challenge of competencies is to make sure that they're strategic that they fit with where the company's headed, not where it's been. The competency model has to be owned by the line manager. Those of us who work in HR, our job is to be the architect. We build the blueprint, we build the framework, we build the approach. Line managers are to be the owners, and they need to feel that. The, 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 the competence model should balance corporate and business unit. It should focus on application and be simple. The tool that we find helpful for building that confidence model is this page. When I work in companies and say, we want to build a confidence model. I worked in a, uh, a large uh, company a couple of weeks ago. Their senior leadership team said, we have three hours. We would like to build a confidence model. This is what we started with. And it's five steps. Step one for about 20 minutes in cell one, what are the challenges or what are the technical skills we're good at today? What do we know how to do? What are we good at doing? And the company began to define those technical skills. In this company, we're good at assessing the environment. We're good at manufacturing. We're good at operational excellence. Cell two, what are we good at socially? How well do we work with each other? How well do we make decisions? How well do we manage people? How well do we manage our culture? That took about 45 minutes. Cell 3 took about 30 to 40 minutes. What are the challenges facing this company in the future? What do we need to be good at as we go forward? Who are our key customers? What do they want from us? Because now we're beginning to look at competencies, not in the past, but in the future. Cell four, probably 45 minutes. Technically, what do we need to be better at? What are the set of skills we're lacking as a company that will be key for us to be successful? And cell five, given those challenges, what do we need to be better at socially? What are the skills we miss? In a three-hour meeting, we were able to come up with a set of competencies that this company needed. And that began to define what good skills look like. If you're a leader in a government agency, I encourage you to have that three hour discussion. What's the skill set of a leader in this agency? If you're a leader in a, in a multinational firm or a private owned enterprise, what's the skill set of the leaders we need? Now I'm willing to be so bold. I hope your human resource professional can facilitate that meeting. In fact, I'm willing to say if your human resource professional cannot facilitate that meeting, they're probably not able to do their job. Because that's what human resource people can do, is to architect or build a blueprint for competencies. Final caveat, at the end of that meeting, it was actually August 22nd. They then spent five weeks they came up on August 22nd with a set of competencies and behaviors that they thought leaders needed. In the five weeks, they thought about what they'd come up with. There was a meeting held yesterday that I wasn't able to attend. I got an email this morning. The HR person said, we had another three-hour meeting, two-hour meeting, on what we did August 22nd. We changed about 20% of what we came up with. Because we've now got a sense, having thought about it, these are the competencies that are important. And the leaders in that organization, the line managers, have got their fingerprints and their commitment all over that confidence model. 
because it wasn't created by somebody in human resources or a consulting firm. By those questions, they have a model. Next step, how do we assess our people against the model? How do we know if our people are doing a good job? Assessment is always a difficult task. And I'm so sensitive to cultural differences. I was in Saudi Arabia talking about assessment. And two things came out as a story that are interesting. One of the Saudi uh, gentlemen looked at me and he said, in the Western world, you build assessments with things that you talk about. You have behaviors and outcomes and tests and coaching and you have rigorous things. He said, let me tell you how we do assessment. I hire my sister's son. He's a good boy, my nephew. I've known him since he was born. He went to a good school. He now works for our company. If he's not doing a good job, I call his mother. And the assessment works fine. Now, I cringe at that a little bit. I don't think that's a management practice we should emulate because it's got nepotism and problems. But I am very sensitive to cultural traditions. Let me give you the other experience we had in Saudi Arabia. Great company in the Mideast. It was a company a little bit like some in Asia, where people don't like giving direct feedback. And so they struggle with that. So they were trying to build an assessment methodology for building talent. One year they had a program called Management by Objectives. And they did an MBO program. The next year they had a behavioral anchored rating scale. And they had another system. The third year, they had a program called Key Result Area Program, which I really like. It stands for K-R-A-P. Think about that. Um, and it didn't work. They put in a new program every year, and nothing worked. They came to me and said, Professor, would you and your team help us build another assessment program? And I said, you've tried three in a row, and they all failed. It's not a program. What you have to find out is why is it not working. And in this culture in the Mideast, it wasn't working because the, the uh, leaders in the company were not able to give employees direct feedback. They could not look at an employee and say, your performance wasn't as good as it should have been. So we had to train them. Let me give you three hints on how we train them. And they're very specific lines. Number one, if you're my boss and you come to me, the first thing you say is, help me understand. It's a great one. Help me understand. Now you're coaching me, not punishing me. Help me understand. The second line is the data. Don't judge the person. Here's the data. You've been late to work three weeks or 60% of the time. Your projects have not sold. Customers are not happy. Number one, help me understand the data. Number two, help me understand, number two, the data. Number three, so that we can fix the problem. Fixing the problem means we'll work together to try to improve. Performance management is not about punishing, it's about helping. And when we can help me understand the data to fix the problem, we begin to build a better system. Now, here's some of the hints for institutionalizing that. One hint is we measure both behavior, which implies potential, and outcomes, which implies the results. We look at coaching, and we give people opportunities to receive it. We collect data from those who are inside the company in a 360 and even those outside the company. We call it a 720. We periodically do state interviews. We ask people, what would you like to be more successful at this company? I'm in a company where the chief financial officer, the head of finance, was a very gifted woman. She was in her mid 40s She was a brilliant financial officer. She had been the chief financial officer for about five years, and she was very talented. We were worried that she might leave the company because she'd been there for a time and she was, she was looking at what's next. 
Though, so the head of the company went to her and did what's called a stay interview. He sat down with her and said, what's it going to take to keep you at the company? What do we have to do to help you stay? And she thought about it and said, I don't know. So he said, think about it. He came back and he said, would you like to move from finance to running a business? And they went back and forth. And over a couple of weeks, she said, I would like to do that. She took over a business that was doing about $40 million U.S. a year. Three years later, it's over $200 million U.S. per year. She stayed at the company because they found a job that was effective for her. So what do those tools look like? And let me now give you some specific tools. On this page is the two by two around behavior and performance. On the bottom axis is performance. Is the employee performing well from low to high? On the top axis is potential because of behavior. We can then begin to rank our employees, how well did they perform and deliver results, and how well are their behaviors indicating they have future potential. The best employees are at the top, often about 4 to 5%. Those are the employees who perform well and have potential to grow. The worst employees are at the bottom. They don't perform well, and they don't have great potential. They are probably called former employees, because we may not keep them in the company. Um, what we want to do is have a discussion with every employee about where they may fit on that grid. Next tool, if we assess people, how do we invest in skills so that our employees will have the ability to grow and develop? What are the ways we can help our people become better in their job within the company? We've again simplified that work, and we said there are six ways you can develop your talent. Let me go through the six ways and try to give examples of what that might mean in your world, in your companies, or in the country of Vietnam. First one is buy. Buy means we bring in new talent. We bring new talent into the company. Sometimes the talent is the entry level. We bring in a new employee. We source a new employee. Sometimes we bring in new talent at a senior level. There's four or five things we've learned about buying or bringing in new talent. Number one, we've got to source talent from new places. And one of the greatest places to source talent is referral networks. Our referral network says the greatest source of our future talent is our current talent. The greatest source of our future talent is our current talent. And what good companies are now doing is they're going to their current employees and saying, do you know somebody who might be a good employee at this company? And if so, they're following up to try to bring that referral into the company. I was in Eastern Europe uh, in some of the uh, Bulgaria, uh, Prague, Budapest, some of those areas. And I had dinner with a group of 20 senior line of business executives, very senior executives. I asked the 20 executives a question. How many of you know somebody who doesn't currently work at the company who would be a good employee at this company? And 19 of the 20 executives said yes. I'm not sure why the other one was at the meeting. <laughs> Maybe he wanted a free meal. Second question. How many of you have had someone from the human resource department come get the name of that person that's in your mind and follow up with them to try to bring them into the company? And at this point, two said yes. In the minds of your best employees are the names of people who would be good in your company. Use that referral network to bring them in. Now, a couple of thoughts about that as an exercise. The most powerful person who's effective through referral hiring is not the person that's hired. It's the person who gives the referral. Let me just go through an example of that. Um, I often learn things not by business, but in my personal life. We've all gone to a grocery store. 
and we've all gotten in line with our basket of food, and we look around and we say, did I get in the right line? I'm not sure if anybody else has done that. I have. Should I change lines or should I stay? When do you never change lines? When somebody gets in line behind you. Because you're in line and now suddenly you got in line behind me and I look at you and I say, he looks very smart. This must be a good line. I've never changed lines when somebody's in line behind me. Referral hiring. The power of referral hiring is the person giving the referral. Because if we hire the person you referred, you're now not at the end of the line. Somebody's behind you. Do not do referral hiring for any employee. Your bad employees, you don't want their referrals because they're probably bad referrals. Do referral hiring from your top 10 to 20% and make it a privilege for them to give that referral and then to follow up because you're more likely to keep the people who come in. And you buy talent by bringing them in. Another thing that we've learned in buying talent in the last few years, another source of talent in the last few years is, uh, is social media. There are some companies, and there may be consultants here, and I hope I don't offend you, like Monster.com, who have big talent bases. The prediction is they're gonna be out of work. Good companies are starting to use Facebook and LinkedIn. And they're going into an area and saying, I need somebody with this set of skills in this geography, Ho Chi Minh City. They go onto Facebook and they can find the 20 or 30 people who have that skill set. And then they find people in their company who know them. And so the technology of social media becomes a source of new talent. Another talent, a buying talent. One of the great sources of future talent are the employees who left the company. 10 or 15 years ago, if an employee left the company, you would consider that employee disloyal. You left the company, you're disloyal. Now if an employee leaves the company and they're talented and they're qualified, stay in touch with them. Because in many cases, they may come back and work for you. And when they come back and work for you, they are more likely to stay longer term. They call it boomerang hiring. And the second time you hire talented people may be the time that you get their long-term dedication. You have to be a little careful with that. Let me just go through the research. It's, I think it's fascinating. By the way, I love this lecture, and I hope you're getting specific ideas. Um, my wife, who's a psychologist, tells me that I have a version in English of what's called OCD, Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. But she says, your OCD is somewhat different. She said, David, she calls me David sometimes, your OCD is Organization Compulsive Disorder. You love to study organizations and how they work and how they get better. And she said, and this is an aside to my discussion, Sometimes you're not very fun to go to dinner with. I said, how can that be? And she said, when you go to dinner, you call the owner of the restaurant over, and on a napkin, you redesign how they should structure the company. And you tell them the training programs they should have to help their, their wait staff be more effective. And he said, that's not a very fun dinner date. That's what I'm doing today. I'm sharing with you the things I've learned about talent and people that hopefully will help you and allow me to pretend I'm OCD. Next talent. Um, keep the people who've left and boomerang, bring them back. The final talent issue is pay attention to the very best. Treat them in great ways so that they feel like they're connected to the company. Buying talent, oh, the final one. If you bring talent in at a senior level in the company, from the outside. The person who comes in should be 30 to 40% better than the internal candidate. If you bring somebody in from the outside and they're just as good as the internal candidate, those inside the company will resist it. If they're 30 to 40% better, those inside the company will be grateful to work for them. Buying talent, bringing new people in, finding ways to source the right right skill set, and having a great system for bringing them in and getting them oriented.
The second option is build. How do we train, how do we develop our existing talent? How do we make sure that the talent we have in place today is doing a great job? There's three ways to develop or build your talent. One, and 50% of the, the, the success, is job assignment or job experience. Most of us learn the most from a job assignment or a job experience. Because when you do it, you learn about it. I think we've all done that. I'm going to confess my age at this. I learned how to do computers with a program called WordPerfect. And that was the software that I used. When I changed from WordPerfect to Word, did I go to a training program? Did I read the manual? No. I started using the new software. I experienced, I touched it. When you get somebody to get more skills, give them a job experience. Give them assignment. Give them a special project. Give them something that will help them learn and grow by touching and doing. That's often 50% of learning. 30% of building or, by, or developing new talent is from training programs. But the training programs that are being offered today need to focus not just on the ideas, but on the application of the ideas. What we often call it in the old world is what's called tourist training. Tourist training. A tourist goes to a country. They take pictures, they get on a bus, and they see the country behind the glass of the bus. They leave the country, they have their pictures, but they haven't changed their hearts. If we're going to do training, it should be a guest experience. And the training investment should be training in the business of the, of the, of the company. Let me give an example. I, uh, about 10 years ago, had the privilege of visiting South Africa. First time I'd ever been in that country. And I ended up, because of travel and time, having a half day free. The driver who drove me from the airport to my hotel was a gracious man. And he said, Mr. Roberts, what would you like to do? And I said, I have a half day free. Could you give me a tour of Johannesburg? And he said, I've lived in Johannesburg. What would you like to see? And I said, what would you recommend? And he said, I live in Suella which is one of the poverty areas of South Africa. And he said, would you like to come to my home? For the next three hours, I spent in his home with his wife, his children, his mother. And it was a marvelous three hours. And I learned for just a minute what it was like to live in South Africa. That changed my life. Because a stereotype I had was shifted. Do the same thing for your training. Let me finish the story. I went back to South Africa the next year and I took my wife. And now she went with him and spent time in his home while I was teaching. Two, three years ago, I took our three children and my son's wife. And they went with him into his home. Their lives are different because of those three hours. They were a guest of the country. They were not a tourist. Good training Building talent is when we're a guest of the business. What does that mean? We come to the training program in teams, not as individuals. We come to the training program not just doing ideas or action learning, but we do learning solutions. Line managers present. Customers attend. The training is focused on the business and what we want the business to do and become. Training. 30%, 50% job experience, 30% training, 20% life experience. Some of the greatest learning that goes on in our lives today is not at work. We participate in a volunteer organization. We join a social club. We observe how things work in our family. We learn by reading. And we do things 20% outside the formal work environment that enable us to be successful at what we do. Buy, build, boost. Boost means we promote the right people. Do we have in place a succession plan in our company that allows us to move the right people into the right jobs? Are we promoting? Are we boosting? Borrow. In the world today, we can access knowledge without owning it. 
I love the concept of art. When I was in Zimbabwe, and I think this applies to Vietnam as well, Zimbabwe claims they have more engineers throughout Africa who come from Zimbabwe than engineers in Zimbabwe who work in Zimbabwe. In other words, they have wonderful engineers who leave the country and work elsewhere. Vietnam. Some of our most talented and brightest people get their degrees outside of Vietnam and they stay away. They go to Canada, which is a wonderful place to live. Not Halifax, but the rest. They, uh, they go to North America, they go to Europe, they go to India. How do we get them back? And the answer is not always to have them back full time. What creative countries are doing is saying, in this niche, in this technical area, we would like to borrow their talent. So you say to that very talented Vietnamese native who has their education and their degree and is working elsewhere, could you give us 5 to 10% of your time? Could you give us a day of money? In addition to your current job, we're not going to have you move. There's a school where a number of us have gone to school, and we're now professors at other institutions. This school has come to us and said, Dave and Clayton Christensen and, and, and some other faculty who are very good in their area, would you give us a half a day to a day a month for the next two years? And we're happy to, because we're dedicated to the school. A lot of the Vietnamese technical expertise is not in the country. We may not be able to repatriate it all, but we can access it all. And can we bring that in and borrow that knowledge so that they come in and teach our local Vietnamese how to do their job and do it well? <clears throat> Balance. We may not always be able to fire the poor performers, but we have to do something. In Japan, if an employee is not performing well, they assign them to a new job. The new job is called window watcher. And they come to work and watch the window. That's not a very good job. If you leave the poor performer in place and allow them to perform poorly, they will demotivate the good performers. And as a poor performer, they have found corporate paradise because they're able to not work and survive and do well. I said earlier, the best thing we can do with the poor performers is place them in our competitor. But we have to do something. And finally, how do we bind, how do we keep our very best people? How do we keep them? And the answer is fairly straightforward. Give them opportunities in our company that they would not receive elsewhere. Talent. Those are the skills and the tools for investing in and beginning to develop talent. And if I buy talent, that means bringing new people in at the entry level, at the senior level. If I build talent by developing through training, job experience, and life experience, if I boost talent by promoting the right people, if I borrow or access knowledge by, by, by working with others, if I remove or shift aside the poor performers, and if I retain the very best, I have begun to build a talent system that works well. And what I need to have is what's called workforce planning that every year I have a systematic review of my strategy and my talent and how we can move it forward. I just talked about confidence. That's the skill set for the future. Do we have the right people in the right job at the right time? Before we break for lunch, I want to talk about commitment and then we'll do contribution after lunch. Commitment. Remember, confidence is they're smart. Commitment, are they willing to work hard? Do we have an employee value proposition? The employee value proposition looks like this slide. On the vertical axis, here's what an employee gets from working at the company. On the horizontal axis, here's what you get back. Here's what the company gives to you. Now, vertical axis, here's what I give to the company. Horizontal axis, here's what I get back from the company. When we've looked at the research on engagement, what we're finding is it's not enough to be satisfied with your job or your boss or your work. You need to be engaged. You need to give your discretionary energy. 
What that suggests is employees who give a lot of value, top left, employees who give a lot of value, the top left, those are the employees, if they don't get things back, who will leave the company. I'm giving a lot of value. I'm producing good things for the company, and I don't get back what's important to me. Those are the employees you'll lose. The employees at the bottom right will stay, and you don't want them to stay. Because they're getting value, but not contributing much. What you want is to have a good access. Now let me tell you, at a personal level, where I learned this. Many here work in academics, and it's in education. It's sometimes hard to measure success. Where I teach at the business school, our dean would ask us and measure us, how much value are you giving the university on the left, on the vertical axis? And then he would allow us to have a choice about what we would get back from working at the university. When I was at the university early in my career, there was a professor named C.K. Prahalat. You have no reason to know C.K. unless you're in the management field. C.K. Uh, passed away about a year ago at age 69, far too young. He was probably the most thoughtful management scholar in the last 30 years. Just a brilliant, brilliant scholar in so many ways. When he had his interview with the dean of the business school, he said, on the scale of 0 to 10, how much value do you give? The answer for CK was a 10. So what he got back was enormous flexibility because he created high value. One year CK said, I'm giving a 10 to the university. What I want back is enormous flexibility. I would like to live in San Diego. Now if you've been to the United States, San Diego is the equivalent of Ho Chi Minh City. It is so beautiful. That was funny. San Diego is on the beach. The average temperature is 70 degrees. It's sunny all the time. It's beautiful. And the dean said to CK, because you're contributing 10 on the vertical axis, you will get flexibility and you can teach at Michigan while living in San Diego. Why do I know this so well? I met with the dean the next day. And he said, what would you like from your experience at Michigan? And I said, I would like to live in San Diego. And the dean looked at me and he said, you're not CK. You don't give as much value. Your value is about a four or a five. You get to live right here. And I'll tell you what you'll teach. But when you create more value, you'll have more flexibility. Five years ago, we moved halfway to San Diego. We moved to Utah. So I'm halfway to good value. Now that's a little joke. What do I need to do with my employees? Be very clear about how much value they're creating. What are my expectations of you? What's the value you're offering my enterprise? Are the standards clear? Are they understood? Can I create clear statements of value? What we've learned about the vertical axis is most people know the top 20% and the bottom 20%. The ones in the middle may vary. We need to have good performance expectations, standards, and measures. And then the horizontal axis, what do you want back from the company? As we've looked at the engagement literature across dozens of consulting firms, we have found seven things that employees might want from the company so that they will be more engaged. The first one is a vision. Do I work in a company that has a strong vision, a purpose? The second is opportunity to learn and to grow. Do I have the chance to grow and develop myself? The third is incentives. Money can be a powerful motivator if there's enough. The fourth is impact. Am I doing work that makes a difference? The fifth is community. Am I working with people I care about and who I want to work with? The sixth is communication. Do I know what's going on? And the seventh is entrepreneurship or flexibility. For those employees who produce the most, we give them the flexibility to do that work. Let me go back.
talking about talent. I'm on uh, slide 14. We're talking about talent. I started by saying talent is four steps. It's the senior executives at the top of the company. Have we created for them succession planning, customized learning, and a high performing team? Talent is the leadership group, the academy of leaders, and talent are the high potentials. And then across the organization, there's three dimensions of talent, competence, commitment, and contribution. So far, we've talked about competence and commitment, and after lunch, we'll talk about contribution. Because we want to begin to help us figure out how are we going to begin to create talent in my company or in my country. And that's where we are right now. I think it's time for lunch, so uh, um, let me uh, turn it over. I hope you're getting some ideas that will have impact. If you have questions, please write them down. And the last 45 minutes of the day, we will go through those questions, and we'll try to respond to those in some detail. I'm not taking questions now so that I can get through my material, and then you'll have the questions at the end of the day that I hope we'll be able to connect with you. But I hope you're getting some specifics. Thank you very much. We'll see you after lunch. Thank you, Professor. We've learned a great deal from your presentation uh, this morning. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, now as schedule, we are going to take a lunch break. And uh, please enjoy your lunch from 12 o'clock to 1.30. Our session will resume sharp at 1.30. So, please kindly use your lunch tag that provided to you earlier. You will find the location of your lunch restaurant indicated on your lunch tag.